So welcome everybody um, to our monthly research webinar. Um, as previous ones, if, if, if you've been to uh, ones before, we are recording this, which means we'll be able to send you a link out at the end um, and then you can share it with anyone you think may be interested in hearing more about uh, the great work that you're going to hear about today. Um, so today's webinar is about the work of the Inflammation Fund, which is uh, one of our linked charities, which means that it has a specific purpose. And over the last three years, we've had uh, significant donations into to the fund and been able to award almost 1.4 million towards uh, research grants in this area. So today is just going to be a small snapshot of these projects and some fantastic young researchers who are being trained here in Leeds. I'm really delighted that we've got such a fantastic lineup of speakers and, and these um, people are all based in Chapel Allerton Hospital, which is one of uh, Leeds Teaching Hospitals trust sites and um, they work within the NIHR Leeds Biomedical Research Centre. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce um, Professor Paul Emery who is the, the director of the research centre. Um, he established the concept of early intervention into inflammation, inflammatory get my words right, <laughs> inflammatory arthritis and um, a model for early arthritis which is now adopted around the world which is um, remarkable and he's instrumental in bringing sensitive imaging into um, rheumatology practice and has published more than 1,100 peer-reviewed article so absolutely incredible and I know he will also um, say the same about his team so I'm going to hand over to Paul, um, Professor Paul Emery to introduce his team, thank you. Thank you very much Esther, it is a real pleasure to uh, feed back some of the support we've had from the Inflammation Fund. Uh, you will recognise this picture of St James's which we tend to use in our, our pictures of our talks. I'm the Versus Arthritis Professor, um, supported by an endowment from them and director of the BRC. <clears throat> Today, uh, we've got uh, uh, a really a snapshot of what we're doing in Leeds, which hopefully you'll begin to understand. It's about what we now call prevention of disease. We haven't completely prevented, but we're a good way along that path. I'm going to start by a little introduction about Leeds itself and, and why we've been relatively successful. Uh, then Letitia uh, is going to talk. Uh, Letitia, who's uh, a clinical research fellow funded by the, uh, the Inflammation Fund. And then uh, Dr. Colvia Mankia, who is yet to join us, but I hope will be there by the time he's talking, who's an associate professor, again with support from uh, the Inflammation Fund. And then I'm going to say a little bit about the vaccination studies we've been doing with Francesco. And actually, um, Francesco, I think, is going to talk also about uh, scleroderma, which is uh, uh, there are some very exciting developments in. So I'll start with a little bit about the history of our Department of Rheumatology in Leeds. Um, in 1995, uh, the team that I was working with in Birmingham was tempted to move up here to the, uh, the lead site. We had a very successful unit in Birmingham, but um, there were really some very exciting opportunities in Leeds. And uh, I persuaded a number of people, about 15 of us came up from uh, Birmingham to Leeds. And that was the start of the story that we're going to talk about. When I arrived, there were four consultants and two registrars. There's now uh, 24 consultants and we have more professors of musculoskeletal disease in the whole of Germany. So it's been quite an expansion. We also have at any one time up to 40 trainees in the department, which makes it probably one of the biggest training centers, especially with orthopedics, which has 70 trainees as well. So it's probably the largest collection of training uh, musculoskeletal experts in the world. 
we were lucky enough in 2008 to get an NIHR, Musculoskeletal Biomedical Research Unit, the only one in the country. We were the only, uh, sadly really, the only uh, NIHR unit in Yorkshire, uh, and it was in musculoskeletal disease. And we've since had that renewed twice, and it's now a biomedical research center, and we're in the process of applying uh, for a renewal in 2022. What is important is to understand how the inflammation fund and preventing arthritis, which is a part of that, has been crucial in this development. Uh, I was lucky enough to bring with me quite a lot of money from Birmingham. They released it because all the people doing the work for which it had been donated came with me. And actually we had a large uh, substantial fund from Droitwich uh, where the consultant there sent the money to Leeds because he felt it was doing the best research. And the inflammation fund has been absolutely crucial. Uh, we've been extremely lucky with the donors, uh, especially one or two who have been very generous. Um, and what we've used the fund for is largely to underwrite staff, by which I mean that uh, we are appoint staff, agreed with uh, the charity that they're good people. And unlike uh, applying for grants, where it may take a year to get the grant, by which time, the uh, exceptional individual may have disappeared, we actually get them in place and then apply for grants. And in fact, we've been very successful, so we rarely use the money, but it, the underwriting allows us to expand and to keep the right people in the right place. Uh, so we're enormously grateful. As a consequence of that, this is just the RAND report, which is done uh, in the Netherlands, but it is used to base a lot of uh, NHS research. And you can see that uh, rheumatology, the Leeds Teaching Hospital Trust, has the highest number of cited publications of any NHS trust. And that for musculoskeletal disease, the uh, university and the trust are ranked first for uh, high impact factor research. This means it's research that's quoted widely and usually is acted upon. So uh, the principles on which we've worked, uh, this was a cartoon that sort of embodied those principles. It, it may be a little bit hard to understand at first, but uh, what we're showing here in orange is inflammation. It's a, a, a cartoon of inflammation and inflammation in our diseases gets steadily worse. Uh, if you treat it early, you, you switch off inflammation. And also if you treat it in a medium term or even late, you switch off inflammation. But what happens is the inflammation causes damage and that re results in reduced function. But if you treat early, function goes back to normal. But if you treat later, you'd never return to baseline. In other words, there's continued damage. And this gap between uh, what the, the, the damage returns to and what would be normal uh, continues for the lifetime of the patient, which is on average 25 years. And that's an enormous cost. And we persuaded government because of this enormous cost that it was well worth treating patients down here early and getting their inflammation and their function back to normal. And that was the principle behind early arthritis clinics, which now are adopted throughout the world. So that was 25 years ago when we first arrived and we set up the biggest early arthritis network uh, throughout Yorkshire when we first arrived. More recently, and what we're going to be talking about today is an understanding that rheumatoid is actually the end point of a whole pile of things that occur earlier. Uh, we start off with people who have genetic risk, and if those genetic risk patients are exposed to environmental risks, and that's predominantly smoking, and surprisingly, um, a protective effect of moderate alcohol. Uh, but somehow they break tolerance, uh, which means that they get antibodies they shouldn't get, and they usually get them locally, and you'll hear about uh, the mouth, the lung, and the gut. And then they start getting symptoms. And actually what happens, people feel unwell well before they get arthritis. They have generalized symptoms. And at this point, their antibodies actually go up. And the whole principle of what we've done is to identify the patients at this antibody stage. And we call this imminent RA and try and do something before they end up getting rheumatoid arthritis. So that was the situation we were in 10 years ago. 
More recently, we found out there's even more stages along this continuum. Uh, we, we've identified new antibodies and we've identified that we can see patients who are going to progress at a stage when they have no joint disease, even on sensitive imaging. And we use MRI and ultrasound for that purpose. So there's a very long preclinical phase before you get arthritis. And the whole idea of the prevention, and this is for inflammatory arthritis, is that we intervene at this stage to prevent the progression to rheumatoid arthritis. So the joint involvement starts here. We want to identify them there. And the patients who actually have rheumatoid are right down the far right of this continuum. So there's a, a real opportunity to make a difference. And that's where we are in 2021. So how have we done it? Well, we had, uh, starting in 2007, uh, an arrangement with primary care, which is the on their portfolio uh, study, where we actually tested patients with non-specific symptoms from all around the country and their bloods came to us in Leeds. And if they were positive, uh, then we saw the patient, ideally. Uh, we even saw patients from down in uh, Devon and Cornwall who are actually very good recruiters. And we could see them at a one-stop hotel visit. They would stay at St. James's. And then we would do lots of, lots of tests, imaging and uh, immunological tests, which would help us uh, determine the likelihood of their progression. And I'm going to leave it to, uh, first of all, Letitia, and then hopefully uh, Colvia to tell you more about this. So Letitia, over to you. Thank you. Um, I will, so if you can pass on the slide, next slide. Thank you. So I will continue saying that it's precisely this infrastructure that Professor Murray mentioned that has allowed us to create the largest prospective primary care study for individuals at risk of RA with more than 10,000 patients recruited so far. We're about to publish the results of one of the analyses done before COVID times, that's why the numbers are slightly lower, which shows that if we look at individuals with non-specific musculoskeletal complaints, 3% have anti-CCP positive antibodies. These antibodies are associated with rheumatoid arthritis. So this is relevant because these subjects have a progression rate of 45%. Focusing on CCP positive individuals, it's going, you're going a bit fast. <laughs> Focusing on CCP positive individuals, the title is the strongest predictor of progression and symptom wise, it is hands and feet that are associated with a higher risk. In contrast, it's reassuring that in subjects with a low anti-CCP titer and no pain in those joints, uh, that progression is very unlikely. In anti-CCP negative individuals, it's more difficult to predict progression as this group is more heterogeneous and includes different types of arthritis. However, hand or knee pain should be seen as a warning sign that will need closer follow-up. Now you can change the slide, please. So this graph shows the stratification of individuals according to the CCP titer and joint symptoms and the progression rates. Those that have both a high titer and pain in hands and feet, you can see that they have a um, high risk of progression and those with low titer and no pain barely progress. I will talk later about how we can predict progression in secondary care individuals, but this study has showed us that in primary care, we can estimate the risk of progression to an inflammatory arthritis in an easy way with just a few tools, just using the CCP2 as a screening test and the joint symptoms. Next slide, please. Next up, yeah, thank you. And why is it important to get this stratification done in primary care? Because in general, the waiting lists to see a rheumatologist are quite long. And in addition, the waiting times have been increased as a result of COVID-19. GPs also sometimes find it difficult to diagnose an inflammatory arthritis. And therefore, if every patient is at the same referral level, we may lose the window of opportunity. So using this simple stratification, we can reduce rapid referral by a 45%, facilitating that early treatment will be given to the patients that really need it. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, Leeds has also carried out um, rheumatoid arthritis research in secondary care. We have a large at-risk cohort with more than a thousand individuals recruited, and this has allowed us to 
validate a clinical arthritis development risk score, evaluate the role of ultrasound in pre-disease, investigate all the predictors of rheumatoid arthritis development, such as ultrasound, x-rays, MRI, CCP3, and immunological biomarkers. And we have also assessed the role of mucosal microbiome for the pathogenesis of the disease. I will start talking about some of these and hopefully my colleague, Dr. Mankia will be able to, to join. And, oh, he's just joined, so he'll be able to continue. Next slide, please. So Leeds published the first risk score model in 2015 with 100 at-risk patients. And this model was validated last year in a cohort of 400 patients. This model was subdivided into one applicable to primary care and the secondary care model. So on the left, you can see the different predictors required for each model. Um, so to make things simple, the presence of each predictor would account for a number of points. And then when all of them are, are added up, then it gives us a number that corresponds with the risk score. Could be low, moderate or high risk. Next slide. A new predictor mo prediction model has been developed, increasing the size sample by four compared with the original one and including a longer follow up. This model is the optimized version of the original one with more reliable data. And we can see that progression rates go from 6% in low risk to 30 moderate risk and almost 80% in high risk ones, which is really important. Please, next slide. This data was presented at the European Congress of Rheumatology last year. And for those who don't have a medical background, uh, power Doppler or PD is how we refer to the joint inflammation that we detect when we do an ultrasound scan. This is particularly important in patients that do not have arthritis yet, because basically the ultrasound scan evidences this joint inflammation that we cannot detect with a standard physical exam. And this is what we refer to as subclinical disease. So we can clearly see that there is a relationship between the number of joints with power Doppler at baseline and their progression rate. And those with more joints affected have a higher progression rate and do it faster. However, is this good enough to predict progression? The role of all the variables is currently being investigated. And another question that we aim to answer is, if those ultrasound changes are present and the joints are being damaged, just like in patients diagnosed with RA, is this a new disease that we could call imaging positive RA? If so, should we treat these patients with methotrexate, like standard of treatments? Ideally, we would like to identify individuals before they have some clinical disease in order to prevent it. So these are things that we aim to answer soon. We periodically give our at-risk patients questionnaires uh, when they come to clinic. These are virtual analog, uh, visual analog scales for general health, pain and fatigue, and the HAC, which is the health assessment questionnaire to assess disability. And results show that there is a significant deterioration in the patient reported outcomes 12 weeks preceding clinical arthritis development. This suggests that at-risk patients have a specific phenotype, maybe we could call it disease, that associates significant comorbidity. Next slide. I'm going to keep this simple as there are many people that don't have a clinical background. Um, if I had said interferon one year ago, most of you would have wondered what that was. Now after COVID, I'm sure the word is somehow familiar. Uh, that is because interferon is released in viral infections as a mechanism of defense. However, interferon is also involved in many inflammatory reactions and therefore it makes sense that it plays a role in autoimmune diseases. Our research shows that interferon indeed plays part in the development of rheumatoid arthritis and possibly even before ultrasound changes take place. So this combined with other biomarkers, other antibodies like rheumatoid factor can be used to identify potential progressors. I will now leave you with my colleague, Dr. Mankia, who will introduce you to further investigations of the team. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, Colvia, do you want to, my screen is moving by itself um, sometimes. I don't, have you got the slides or, uh, I, can, I can move them if you don't mind, occasional going backwards and forwards. Okay, no, that's your, I haven't got them tanned actually. So if, you, if okay. I say next, um, we can, right, we can yeah. do it like that. <laughs> Okay, fine. We'll continue. Right. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'll go to the next slide and just start back with this diagram. There's a couple of 
important points related to the work we've been covering over the last five years that I just wanted to um, outline in the next few slides. So it's just back to our model of rheumatoid arthritis, where we have an at-risk phase on the left, where people don't yet have arthritis, and then the clinical phase on the right, which is when arthritis develops, and this is where conventionally we start treatments. But as Professor Emery outlined at the start, we understand now that there are several steps in this journey, several steps in the continuum. And we've been particularly interested in the very initial phase. So that's when an individual's genetic risk, if we go to the next bit, um, interacts with environmental factors. And this is what initially causes that autoimmune response, the autoimmunity that then progresses on to arthritis. And then if you go to the next bit for our question, what we've really been interested in is trying to understand what the trigger is for this autoimmune process. And, by extension, what we might do to prevent that. And actually the trigger for rheumatoid, quite surprisingly, has nothing to do with the joints. It's a disease of the joints, but the trigger happens a long way from the joints at so-called mucosal sites. And these are areas such as the mouth, the lung and the gut, parts of our body that are in regular contact with the outside environment. And what we know now is that um, such environmental interactions at these sites cause localized inflammation, and then in the context of changes in bacteria at these sites, you initially get a local autoimmune response that in some individuals over time will stop being local and will progress to a more general autoimmune response in the blood. And then finally, inflammation occurs in the joints. And that's the sequence of progression uh, that we now understand. So we've been particularly focused on the mouth and also looking at the gut in our investigations in Leeds over the last few years. So if we go to the next bit. So one of the, the nice parts of uh, working here over the recent years is the extent of collaborations we've had. So we've worked very closely with dentists at the Leeds Dental Institute and oral microbiologists who are highly specialized in this area who work at the University of Leeds in the Welcome Building. And we got together and decided we wanted to investigate the initiation of rheumatoid and have a look closely at what's going on in the mouth. And here are some uh, results of a study that we did. We looked in some detail at periodontal disease or gum disease. And you can see the three groups of patients here, healthy controls, our individuals at risk of rheumatoid, and then patients with early rheumatoid. And what we found is that periodontal disease was significantly increased in individuals at risk of rheumatoid, much higher than that seen in controls and even to the same levels that we see in patients who have arthritis. And we saw that in the chronic form of periodontal disease and also in the active acute form of periodontal disease. And, and what this is telling us is that periodontal um, gum inflammation is increased and established even before individuals get their arthritis, suggesting it could be triggering and driving the process. So if we go to the next one, as well as doing these very detailed quantitative measures, we asked our dentist to give us a clinical diagnosis of periodontitis, and they, they found the same thing. So you see here that our at-risk individuals who haven't yet got rheumatoid have got the highest level of periodontal disease compared with controls and even early RA patients. So this is telling us that there is a lot going on in the mouth and around the gums before arthritis develops, suggesting it could be driving the condition. If we go to the next part. So while we were seeing these patients, we took the opportunity to take lots of detailed samples. Uh, we took plaque samples, gingival fluid samples and saliva. And then we gave these to our oral microbiologists who did some really sophisticated DNA extraction techniques and um, sequencing techniques. And they were able to characterize individual bacteria that are present in the mouth in, in our patients. So here are some headline results that's worth sharing. Um, if you look on the right there, there's an organism called P. gingivalis, which we found particularly interesting. The yellow dots are individuals at risk of rheumatoid. And you can see that they had the highest levels of this bug, P. gingivalis, compared with the controls and the early RA patients. And we saw this relationship only for P. gingivalis. We didn't see it for other bacteria, which we thought may be interesting. So it suggests that this organism P. gingivalis is particularly enriched and active in individuals at risk of rheumatoid. That's interesting for one particular reason. It's because P. gingivalis may be capable of initiating 
anti-CCP antibodies, which are the antibodies in rheumatoid. And that's because it's the only organism known to possess an enzyme which can citrullinate proteins and, and, and create this anti-CCP response. So if we go to the next one, we went further than just looking at individual organisms. Uh, working with the microbiologist, we managed to characterize the entire microbiome in the oral cavity. That is all bacteria present in the oral cavity. There, is, there are lots of results here, and I'm just sharing with you ones of particular interest. Um, this is the alpha diversity, which tells us how diverse or in, how, how rich the bacterial composition is. And you can see in the healthy site graph there on the left, the CCP at risk individuals again look different. They have a lower diversity compared with the other groups, suggesting that their bacterial composition is different. And if we go to the next one, this is detailed uh, microbiological data, which took some time to uh, collect and analyze. This is looking at um, all of the bacterial genera present uh, in the oral cavity. And it's difficult to see it all clearly from here, but it essentially confirms what we saw in the last slide and the one before that Porphyromonas gingivalis is enriched in at-risk individuals. In the bottom figures there, the Venn diagrams, you can see the very low numbers in the CCP at-risk individuals in the yellow circle. So that tells us that they have very few unique organisms. Um, so the picture put together from this is that individuals at risk of rheumatoid have a different uh, bacterial composition. It's less enriched. Um, it, it, they have high levels of certain important bacteria, such as P. gingivalis. So if we go to the next one, so we were quite encouraged by this work, which took a lot of effort and collaboration. And building on from this, we've now been looking at the gut in a similar way. Uh, Chris Rooney is a microbiologist who's been working with us on this, and we've published two papers listed here in the last year on this. So what we found is that the bacterial composition in the gut is altered in individuals at risk of RA, and we believe it may be driving the onset of joint disease. We found that individuals at risk of RA have a distinct um, diversity compared to controls. Those that progress, those at risk individuals that go on to get arthritis have a still further altered bacterial composition with the organisms that we see somehow connected and linked to one another. And we found that this alteration correlated with clinical risk markers and also immunological risk markers. So the events in the gut in these at-risk individuals seem to be correlating with the immuno immunological disturbances in the blood and even the clinical features that patients report. So this is again, very encouraging, suggesting that link between the gut, the blood, and then the joints. And where we want to go with this is a couple of areas. We, we, we want to now do things at the patient level, connect the gut, and the uh, oral cavity, and we're looking to, to do that in the next phase. And ultimately, we're looking to now treat individuals. So take individuals with periodontal disease uh, who are at risk of RA and seeing if we can treat that and improve their outlook. And actually, we're about to start that study today. So I'm about to go and see patients straight after this um, to, to begin that next phase. So I bring you back to this diagram, the model of rheumatoid, and we've talked about the at-risk phase on the left this key stage of disease initiation. We've also been interested in another stage further along the continuum. So this is the stage of transition when individuals go from being at risk to first getting arthritis. If we go on to the next bit, what we want to understand is can we predict which individuals are going to get arthritis? So if you're at risk, which are the people that are gonna transition and develop disease? So there are lots of potential markers here that people have been interested in and we've looked at. I wanna share one very recent thing that seems to be uh, of high value and quite encouraging. This is the combination of antibody tests. So, so antibodies in rheumatoid is well known. Uh, we know that anti-CCP is good for diagnosis and good for prognosis. But what we've done is tried to combine antibody tests, picking a newer antibody assay called anti-CCP3, and the results are really quite striking. So if we go to the next bit on this build, if you have a high level of anti-CCP, the conventional test, but your anti-CCP3 test is negative, your risk is actually quite low. So it drops from over a third to under 10%. Now that's quite reassuring for a patient to know. If on the other hand, you have a high level of CCP2, but your CCP3 is also positive, your risk of progressing quickly to rheumatoid is around 50%. 
again, very useful for a patient to understand and also for us in terms of following and intervening. And we go to the next bit. Um, so as well as antibodies, uh, we've also found that the immune cells in the blood are very important in terms of predicting risk, in particular T cells, which is a, a type of white blood cell. Uh, next bit in the build. If you have abnormal um, T cell uh, compositions, if your T cell subsets are abnormal in the blood, your risk of getting rheumatoid is much higher. And you can see in the red line here that people progress to getting rheumatoid very quickly if their T cell subsets are abnormal compared with if they are normal. So we feel this is potentially going to be a clinically useful marker as well. So back to our model again, um, the data we've shown here is really informing what we now believe is the new version or the new model of our understanding of rheumatoid. We're learning more about the first step, that first hit of disease where genetic and environmental risk combine to give you antibodies for the first time. We're learning more about the second hit further along, which is when people move from being at risk to actually getting arthritis in the joint. And we're particularly excited about this uh, predictive phase. So when individuals have multiple antibodies, we think this tells us about the timing of when they're just about to get joint disease. And, and this is going to be the right time to intervene for a preventive treatment, preventing somebody from progressing onto the phase of arthritis. We go to the next bit. So just to summarize there, the work we've done um, over recent years has led us to the position now where we can confidently and accurately identify people who are at risk of getting rheumatoid. Go to the next one. Uh, we, we know several tests that we can now use to predict an individual's score, uh, predict an individual's risk, sorry, of getting rheumatoid quite accurately. And we can combine these tests into prediction scores. We can even switch tests. So depending on the availability of tests, different prediction scores can be arrived at. And these have now been validated. New markers are coming to light and we're very encouraged by the fact that combining antibodies can identify individuals who are about to get joint disease. We think this is going to be an ideal population to intervene on for prevention. And there are now prevention studies uh, active and recruiting in, both in the UK and around the world. The outcome of these studies, the results will be available uh, within the next one to two years. And this will be a very exciting time in terms of planning the next phase. So this will inform us because what, what you get from treatment studies is useful in terms of what where you go next. So. It's an exciting time. All this will come together, I think, for the next phase um, uh, for the, over the next five years. Thanks very much, um, Colbert. Um, I've come to the end. I've got of it. Just a, there's an acknowledgement, I think, just at the end. Oh, there, there we, we go. go. Yeah. For, for everybody in the group. So it's a, as everyone can see, I think people have described various group members, but we're very multidisciplinary. We have rheumatologists there uh, mm -hmm. with Jackie Lawrence and Andrea. Uh, Chris and Mark Wilcox from microbiology, Deirdre and Zijan from oral microbiology. So two sets of microbiologists working on the microbiome. Um, Heidi is working with us, who's a podiatrist, who's developing an interest in this area. And we have immunology and laboratory um, support as well. Francesco, do you want to do your own slides or... Um... Good morning, uh, everybody. And yes, Paul, uh, I will. Let me see now. Uh, I can stop sharing. Uh, yeah. We should be able to see. We can, yes. Yes, my, my slide. Okay. So, um, good morning again. Um, thank you for extending to me this uh, invitation. I see many names very well known in the in the audience. Um, and you heard about arthritis. Uh, now, when Paul um, also referred to as Professor Emery, but <laughs> um, had this vision back in 2008 and nine, uh, he also had another vision to extending this approach to the perhaps the most complex condition in, in the rheumatology, the scleroderma. There's not much history of research uh, in scleroderma in Leeds. So I was fortunate to be cherry picked uh, when I was back in Philadelphia then uh, to come and establish 
a research program that would build on what was done in rheumatoid and trying to understand and progress the knowledge and the way we manage patients with scleroderma. And uh, we come now 10 years from there and um, it is impressive the amount of, 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 of work and innovation that we're doing uh, at world level. So thank you Paul for that and for your continued support. Um, and that was was could happen actually thank, thanks to the support of the information fund uh, at the beginning um, and throughout. So you heard about arthritis and you thought it was complicated. Well, scleroderma is a bit worse than that. Um, it is autoimmune like arthritis, but uh, despite inflammation, the, the, the symptoms, the, the, the problem the patient have are mostly related to scarring. And this scarring happens in the skin, happens in the lungs, happens in the, in, in the gastrointestinal tract, in the joints, in the heart, happens everywhere. And, and we classify as, as two types of different scarring of fibrosis. The one that happens in the tissues, and here you see skin uh, when it's normal and when it's affected by scleroderma, so it's more compact. Perhaps it's more intuitive to see in the lung when it's normal, when it's affected by scarring. And you see, you see a very little amount of lung working in this section. Uh, all can happen in the vessels. And you see here, a, a, a small vessels in brown here that disappear in the skin, or a big vessels like this artery that is supposed to be nice and wide. And when it's affected by scarring, it becomes narrower. So the blood brought to the organs uh, is reduced. Now, uh, of course, this reflect is reflected in the in the different symptoms that patients have. And you see here the skin scarring or the uh, skin ulceration or the lack of blood in the lungs, for instance, that sometimes unfortunately causes patients to need oxygen to be able to breathe. Now, the issue with scleroderma is that when this happens and we start to treat patients at this stage, it's very similar. What we were doing before uh, Paul uh, established this new paradigm of treating arthritis early and we were treating rheumatoid arthritis when we had already joint destruction. We are still doing that for scleroderma. We are treating patients when they already have this current. So, and you see then the opportunity. Now, just to tell you how is this current uh, related to, the, to, to time, this is a, a, a slide from a review that we recently published in The Lancet to tell you that it's telling pretty much the same story. There is a fibrotic damage and a vascular damage here in pink and in blue, and this they accumulate over time. And, and this is just how this relates to skin fibrosis and lung fibrosis or, or lung pulmonary artery hypertension. Now, the, I, I would like to draw the attention here on this part, on the left part of this slide, where you can see that before we even make a diagnosis of scleroderma, there is already a bit of damage. It's only a tiny bit, but it's already there. And this is the window of opportunity that we have to treat patients before they have a damage in the skin, in the lung, or in the rest of their system. Now, you see here this RP, which is the main symptom that it precedes the diagnosis is renal, and we'll talk about it. But first, I would like to tell you why this window of opportunity is so attractive and how we can build this opportunity, and which is pretty much the work we've done in, in the past uh, six, seven years. So prevention, of course, is is ideal in every condition. It, it, it's ideal in cancer, it's, it's, it's ideal in, for every disease, you, you realize that not having is better than curing it. But in scleroderma, this is particularly true because once the damage happens, it's irreversible. And so the window of opportunity here to treat scleroderma like you have seen for arthritis before you have skin scarring or before the vessels get so narrow that they don't bring enough blood is of course primarily important. The other element is that in scleroderma, this is a schematic of how the um, damage happens. Every time there is a bit of damage, yes, there is a bit of a remission, but it's never to the point the patients were before. So it's a, it's a sort of a stepwise approach and every time there is damage, patients are worse, even if they recover from there than they were before the damage happened. Now, 
the issue is that when we treat patients before any damage happens, patients are fine and they're not even patients, they don't classify our patients. And so we need to establish a paradigm that is similar to what we have accepted for other conditions like cholesterol and heart attack. So people is very aware now that high blood pressure and cholesterol, which don't bring any symptoms, are crucial to be treated to prevent heart attack. And this concept that has been accepted for some condition is still being considered very pioneering in immune diseases only a few years ago. And now it starts to become a bit more accepted thanks to the work of Leeds that Paul has pioneered. Now, how do we build this window of opportunity? There are two pieces they need to fit together for us to be able to establish a prevention strategy for scleroderma or for uh, other immune diseases, but I will focus on scleroderma here. And the first is, as I just mentioned, the awareness. The awareness that there is a risk of developing a disease before you are diagnosed with a disease, like cholesterol and heart attack. So we, what is the cholesterol here that we need to treat? And the second is, once we establish this risk, how we can stratify people that have high risk versus lower risk to start the prevention. Now, you've seen here this RP, the main symptom that precedes scleroderma, sometimes for up to 10 years before diagnosis, is Raynaud's phenomenon. And Raynaud's is a very common condition, it's a vasospasm of the, of, of, of the peripheral vessels that can be triggered by cold or by any emotional stress. And there are six to 10 million of, of of people with brain holes in UK, and only a tiny fraction of those will have actually a risk of developing scleroderma. But brain holes, since it's benign in more than 90% of cases, it's not well recognized. So the first effort we needed to do to establish a platform, a, a, a risk platform, was to raise awareness of brain holes. And this is when SRUK and uh, the Interleads Care Child at the time helped us to go on the streets, literally, and establish a mobile clinic where we're saying, if your hands look like this here in the picture, you might have Renault come and see us. This was a, a, a very original initiative that we've done in Brigade Street here in Leeds. We didn't know whether it worked, we didn't know whether people were even bothering to coming in. So it, it was really an experiment. It was right before the pandemic. Uh, we, we plan to, to repeat it in 2020, but of course it couldn't happen. And in seven days, we screened 623 people just walking, looking at their hands and say, I might have Renault. And we diagnosed 556. And these 556 people, 40% had a family history of Renault. Once we were taking a quick questionnaire, they were, they were responding and they were saying, Oh, actually, my mom had it, my sister had it. And one in five, one in four, actually had family history of autoimmune diseases, which we know is a key risk factor for developing autoimmune diseases. Now, this initiative was so well um, uh, received that we had a very big media coverage. We were, we were featuring the, in Trust Me, I'm a Doctor in BBC too, and we had the, 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 the fortune really to reach um, millions of people. So we clearly increased awareness of brain old thanks to the intervention of the charity. Now, okay, Raising awareness, we're going to keep working on that. We know the, mod the model work, and as soon as we are allowed back on the streets, we will repeat the, the uh, initiative. But once we make people aware of their brain nodes, what we can do, how we can establish a, a prevention treatment. So we established in 2018 a national cohort of people at risk of scleroderma. This has been funded by the Kennedy Trust, the BRC and the um, Leeds Cares, where we say, OK, now that we know that we have brain nodes, that you have brain nodes, if you have any additional risk factors and the research that has been going on from 2010 until 2019 has identified some key risk factors like the presence of antibodies, like some changes in the in the in the um, capillaries that we look with a test here at Chapel Allerton called capillaroscopy that increased the risk of scleroderma. And we didn't know how much this was the risk, but we know that it was a higher risk. And we've been following them every six months doing all sorts of tests for three years so that we can establish a risk model. 
these tests here are quite complicated. They are proteomics. They, they, there is DNA genotyping that's been adopted by, by uh, NIHR. But to say, okay, now that we know that there are people in these 11 centers throughout UK that have been followed for Renault, how we can establish a risk model. And why this is so important? Because scleroderma is, besides being severe, is also extremely heterogeneous. And these ray nodes evolve into scleroderma in 15% of people. That this 15% is a rule in scleroderma that happens all the time for most of the manifestations, and we don't know why. And once they have scleroderma, only 15% of patients will end up having severe skin fibrosis. This is a, a patient that had severe skin fibrosis only 18 months apart, these are these two pictures. Whereas some other patients, they have a very mild skin fibrosis, and after 30 or 40 years, they're still uh, uh, in a very mild condition. And the same happened for the lungs. Only 15% of people ending up having a severe lung involvement that requires oxygen. So we need clearly to identify an approach that can, that, that can predict who is going to have a severe disease. We've done that from Raynaud to scleroderma. This is a paper that's about to be published on The Lancet again, where we've seen that if patients do not have ANA and they only have Raynaud, and ANA is an immunological test that's saying that you have an autoimmune activation in your blood, the risk of developing scleroderma is extremely low, 5 to 8% at five years' time. Whereas if you have these additional risk factors with the, that you see named here, and the, perhaps it, the, it's, it's not so important to, to name them now, but the risk is progressively higher. Now, and we, to establish a prevention platform, to even think of a trial where we can treat people before, we need to be able to identify these patients that, that uh, we do, but stratify further. In a clinical trial, you need something called power. You need to be able to predict whether a treatment is able is effective or not by measuring the effect of that treatment in a, in, in a group of patients. And when this group is less than 50%, it's very hard to, to um, power a study, to, 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 to conceive an intervention study. So, so here we, you see that even with the older risk factor, we're still at 20% in 12 months. So there was clear need of further biomarkers. And that's where the work of, of, of Leeds has, has put a critical uh, uh, element here. We have identified additional risk factors still in the blood and this type interference score, type 1 interference score, similar to what you have heard from, from, uh, uh, from uh, Paul's group, that is actually stratifying this 24% of patients that develop scleroderma in 12 months into 52 and 48. Stratify meaning that if they are positive to this test, they have 50% risk of developing scleroderma. If they are negative, uh, they have 48 percent. So, so, uh, so here, here you are. We can now identify 50 percent of patients that have uh, that uh, that have risk of developing scleroderma in in the next 12 months. And this is the platform. This is the cohort that we're targeting for our intervention studies. Now, we went beyond the the risk of Raynaud to scleroderma because I told you even after scleroderma happens there is a small proportion of patients that actually progresses from having a mild lung to a severe lung and this is we, we used another biomarker the ERF test that we, we published a few years ago and by, by using this biomarker we're able to stratify again for a risk of 50 percent of progression instead of our 15 percent so even if we need to test a new intervention for lung progression now we have a tool that can identify patients. So this is called precision medicine and will allow only patients that actually may benefit more of the intervention to go into the clinical trial. And we've done the same for, for, for GI involvement. We are a, a bit behind there because it's, it's harder. But you see there is a group, there is a proportion of patients against 10-15% that develop scarring in their guts. This is an x-ray of the small power where you can see it is dilated and and poorly mobile. Now, when this happens, unfortunately, some nasty bacteria grow in the small bowel and they give some severe symptoms. Now, we have identified this MRI-based scoring where we can measure the movement of this gut and trying to predict who is starting to have a, 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 a lower movement of the gut that can benefit from a clinical trial. 
what are the trials we're trying to do? So here it is. If this was all our scleroderma cohort, now we're able to identify patients that have higher risk. And this higher risk now is it becomes our smaller cohort, our focused cohort, where we can randomize and give some patients a new intervention, in this case it's an anti-type 1 interferon, or observe patients. And we can measure the efficacy of the new intervention only in this small cohort. Again, this is a pioneering design that we're doing both in rheumatoid and in scleroderma. So, you heard, not dissimilarly from rheumatoid, the goal of the research program in scleroderma that is funded by the NIHR, by the Kennedy Trust, and by, and by the Inflammation Fund, is to identify people at high risk of progression to scleroderma or within scleroderma of severe organ involvement, so that we can establish a preventive intervention before the organ damage and prevent ill health and keep patients out of hospital. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, um, Francesco. Um, Esther, I wonder if we should take, we, I know we uh, can say, going to say something about vaccination, but we can do that. And, uh, and Francesco's in a clinic and may well be called away. So uh, perhaps if there are any questions, we could take those now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, um, Professor Emery. If people want to um, remain anonymous, they can put their question in the chat. Um, if you are happy to um, appear on screen, then we can give you access to, to speak and ask your question. Um, just let us know. <clears throat> I mean, while we're waiting for people to um, come through with any questions, um, I wonder um, if I can ask a, a question, Professor Emery, in terms of um, what time scale do you think if you had the funding, you, you know, we would be at a stage where you would be able to prevent arthritis occurring in, in all patients. Well, there's no doubt all the research is limited by the availability of people to do the work. We have more work than we've got people. And certainly if uh, there were more money available, uh, we could speed things up substantially. Um, we were very lucky that uh, Calvia was uh, offered two jobs in Oxford and we managed to keep him in um, Leeds and that was a great uh, benefit of, of having funding available. We, we have research fellows and research openings that uh, we'd be delighted to have more people and it is really at a critical phase I think at the moment. Uh, I would say if you had uh, if we had unlimited funds we would probably speed things up by a, probably 50% a at least. Yeah. Amazing. Um, yeah, because it is the, the trouble is when you're doing clinical trials, they these days they are very labor intensive and they do need a lot of people to do. It may seem very straightforward to give a, a, a simple drug to a patient, but the amount of paperwork involved and all the uh, official documentation you have to do does require a lot of investment. You know, drug companies develop drugs and they cost on average half a billion to get to wow. market. Yeah. So for us to do it at our own level, we do it obviously vastly cheaper than that, but it is very dependent on finance and resources. Thank you. Um, so we've got some questions in uh, the Q&A section. So the first one is, in the longer term, what do you think should be done to enable even earlier RA intervention? Should there be routine screening of particular groups, possibly those with the high risk factors? Should there be more focus on education? That's a very good question because and we, we've we never been able to do screening as such. We do what's called case selection. We select patients on the basis of seeing their primary care physician. They already have actually come into the system, if you like. But we are reaching the stage with the accuracy and the precision of our biomarkers that it could be possible, for example, to screen everyone with a family history, all females over a certain age, uh, any female that smokes. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, you could select a, a list of risk factors and screen all those. And that is something, again, if we had the, 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 the staff to do, I think we would we are in a position to actually do, in which case, it would be like screening, uh, as Francesco was talking about, for cholesterol. 
um, you would actually intervene. And the sort of interventions, the earlier you go, the more uh, conservative they can be. Uh, we are doing interventions with increased periodontal therapy. Um, and uh, it is, we, we don't know how much that will affect the, the long-term outcome, but we, certainly we know that patients with good oral health have much lower progression uh, along the pathway. So uh, I think that we're not far away. Uh, it's just a question of time and resources for that. That's very interesting. Yeah, because the other part of the question was, you know, should, um, oh, it's gone. Uh, you know, should there be more of a focus on education? So, you know, I suppose there's, <coughs> you know, potentially a piece of work with dentists is there around. I think, may I intervene here? I think the education is, is crucial. Uh, before we had the awareness event in, in 2019, uh, we had 25 patients only with brain nodes who were following here, so at risk. After that, now we have 250. And, and we have diagnosed early scleroderma in 20. So even beyond the research agenda of eventually helping us to prevent it, we have established an early diagnosis just because of awareness. So ed education is crucial and the support of the charity to implement education is, is, is very important because it's not one of the things that can be usually funded by other funders like the MRC or the, or the NIHR. I see two other questions too. Just to, yeah. just to finish the education thing, um, 25 years ago, or even longer, 30 years ago, uh, when arthritis was considered completely untreatable and no point diagnosing it, I, we used to write to, well, in, in, a thousand GPs every three months about early referral. And primary care has really got the message, I think, now. And uh, we, around Leeds, our GPs are very good at referring early. So uh, uh, the education started with the GPs, when you get it, you, when you have, you have to be very careful about the education you give to the general public that it's accurate and you can cope with the demand that you induce when yes. something as common as arthritis. Uh, but there's no doubt that education is going to be a very big part of prevention. Thank you. Um, yeah. So another question is, how many patients a year could the arthritis work support, and how many interventions are happening now? So I guess, yeah, what's the gap? Uh, well, we, we are, we do get a lot of referrals and the, obviously the, the more referrals you get, the harder it is to see them very quickly. And that's been made much worse over the last year because of COVID. We have continued to see patients, but the actual capacity has reduced. We've seen them throughout the, the uh, pandemic, but the fact you've got to get up, dressed up in PPI and uh, the actual logistics of it make it uh, the numbers smaller but hopefully uh, that might be changing. Um, I would never say don't refer. And second part. Yeah, poor in a group, they, they see two to 3,000 patients with early RA per year, and we see 500 patients with scleroderma and 250 patients with RA. Now, of these patients, the one that are enrolled in clinical trials, and to, to answer to the other part of the question, there are three trials going on now, two in RA and one in scleroderma there are maybe 40 or 50. So there is so much room to grow, to enroll patients in trial if we had the capacity to do that. We are limited by capacity, as Paul was saying. So of these patients that we've seen, they, of course they, they do not all meet the criteria to be in trials, but there will be at least hundreds of patients that could be enrolled in trials, whereas we have maybe 30 or 40 patients in trials today. So there is so much room to grow. That's brilliant. And another question is, is Leeds unique in the work you're doing um, on RA and scleroderma? Well, I can tell you that uh, when Paul told me about prevention in 2009, I said, what? <laughs> so at that time, there was really, it was super pioneering. And uh, that is that was the other difficulty. There was no, it, it was so unrecognized that there was no funding for that. Then we started to work self-funded, as we say, so funded here from Leeds, from our own, because we believed in the idea. And we started to, to publish. So Paul, Paul and group have published 
20, 30 papers already on prevention. So now this has been accepted and we are still 10 years. We have five, 10 years more experience than other centers, but now other centers are starting to follow. And that's been started by the work Absolutely. here in Leeds. And so, so really what you're saying is if, if you had more people in the team, you'd be able to get results quicker. More patients would be able to benefit from the work that you're doing. Yes, Paul cohort, the primary care cohort is the only, is still the only example in, in, in the world of such a big cohort, but there are centers now in Australia, in Denmark, that they are starting the same. And they are four or five years behind. Uh, for, for scleroderma, there is, uh, the Ray Nose cohort, this Kennedy cohort that you've seen is the only example in the world yet, but they just started one in Italy, they started one in France. So in two or three years, they will be where we are now. We still have this opportunity to speed up things two or three years if we invest here in Leeds. And Professor uh, Emery, yeah. you, were, you were saying that now is, is quite a crucial time where we, we do want to try and accelerate the work? Oh, absolutely, because we do we, we know the model works. Um, and just to, to re-emphasize what uh, Francesco was saying, um, as we have uh, understood that autoimmunity has this prodromal period where you have the uh, immune abnormality, but not the organ damage, there is the real opportunity to intervene. And this is now also true. It's true in scleroderma, it's true in lupus, and it's true in Sjogren's. And as the department's grown, we've grown specialists in these areas as well. So there's a, there's a need for this to be applied across the board. In fact, prevention is clearly you know, we've got a national health service, but it's really a national disease service because you don't actually get into it normally until you have a disease. Whereas the, the real health economic benefits come from preventing a chronic disease. And so we, we're trying to do it to spread to the other diseases as well. And they, they again, are, it is totally limited by resources. And I mean, you know, you've seen from the work that you've done, Professor Emery, that you've got an amazing team working you know with you and I suppose it the the key thing is bringing in the next generation of researchers is it absolutely yes and we the thing I didn't say at the beginning the reason we grew uh, so rapidly was that I had arrangement with our dean that uh, because we were doing so much research every time we appointed a trainee they disappeared into research uh, and there was no one to do the clinical the straightforward NHS work. So we were allowed, uh, with the support of the Information Fund, to appoint two people to every post. So they were appointed as a, a pair. One of them would do research in their PhD, and the other would do clinical work, and then vice versa. So by that method, we trained, and we've trained a, a huge number of uh, academic professors and uh, associate professors, uh, most of which have stayed, most of whom have stayed in Leeds, but we've also exported a few to big centers elsewhere. That's brilliant, really remarkable um, what you've achieved. And um, I see there's, there's no more questions, but um, really huge thank you to you and the team for, for everything that you're doing. And um, obviously the more we're able to generate in donations and gifts in wills um, to support your work, then the faster you'll be able to um, continue supporting the patients in, in Leeds and around the world, um, you know, with the work that you're doing. It's, it's amazing. Just a final comment on the vaccination, which we did say we would talk about. Um, we will possibly go into more detail in, in a future date. But uh, what we have done is uniquely, uh, with the help of our patients who have been enormously cooperative at a very busy time coming to hospital, they've had their bloods taken before vaccination and then four weeks after, and then they're going to have it after their, their second uh, uh, inoculation, uh, which will enable us to see the impact of the therapies and the diseases we have on the vaccination response, both uh, at the antibody level, which is relatively straightforward, but also at the T-cell level, which people may have heard about, which is much more complex to do, but we will have a unique set of data. And in fact, what that is... Uh, hopefully going to produce results in the next couple of weeks. That's very exciting. Thank you. So thank you very much um, 
for um, speaking today. It was um, I found it incredibly interesting. I hope everyone attending um, did. And we do do these research webinars each month. So um, if you want to um, be on the list to be invited each time, please let us know. Um, and um, there is always an opportunity to follow up with questions by email afterwards um, for anybody who's watching the recording of this, because um, we, we always like to, to tell you as much as you'd like to know um, about the subjects that we're discussing. So thank you everybody for attending and thank you very much to our speakers. Um, really appreciate your time. I know how busy you all are, so very grateful. Thank you. And a thanks from us, Edsta. Uh, just to say to the, those who are listening who aren't medical that, um, Esther and her team have revolutionized the charitable status I and mean, it really is uh, now a very professional operation and to like to work with and just to say all the money that's donated not, none of it it all goes to research so it's a, a very efficient way if, compared to some other charities. Thank you Professor Emery and um, I hope you'll have a, a great day. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.